but no sooner was I initiated than she made me useful in twenty different ways. All the tedious parts of her work were shifted on to my shoulders, such as stretching the frames, stitching in the canvas, sorting the wools and silks, putting in the grounds, counting the stitches, rectifying mistakes, and finishing the pieces she was tired of. At sixteen, Miss Murray was something of a romp, yet not more so than is natural and allowable for a girl of that age. But at seventeen, that propensity, like all other things, began to give way to the ruling passion, and soon was swallowed up in the all-absorbing ambition to attract and dazzle the other sex. But enough of her. Now let us turn to her sister. Miss Matilda Murray was a veritable hoyden, of whom little need be said. She was about two years and a half younger than her sister. Her features were larger, her complexion much darker. She might possibly make a handsome woman, but she was far too big-boned and awkward ever to be called a pretty girl, and at present she cared little about it. Rosalie knew all her charms, and thought them even greater than they were, and valued them more highly than she ought to have done, had they been three times as great. Matilda thought she was well enough, but cared little about the matter. Still less did she care about the cultivation of her mind, and the acquisition of ornamental accomplishments. The manner in which she learnt her lessons, and practised her music, was calculated to drive any governess to despair. Short and easy as her tasks were, if done at all, they were slurred over, at any time and in any way, but generally at the least convenient times, and in the way least beneficial to herself, and least satisfactory to me. The short half-hour of practising was horribly strummed through, she, meantime, unsparingly abusing me, either for interrupting her with corrections, or for not rectifying her mistakes before they were made, or something equally unreasonable. Once or twice I ventured to remonstrate with her seriously for such irrational conduct, but on each of these occasions I received such reprehensive expostulations from her mother, as convinced me that, if I wished to keep the situation, I must even let Miss Matilda go on in her own way. When her lessons were over, however, her ill-humour was generally over, too. While riding her spirited pony, or romping with the dogs or her brothers and sister, but especially with her dear brother John, she was as happy as a lark. As an animal, Matilda was all right, full of life, vigour, and activity. As an intelligent being, she was barbarously ignorant, indocile, careless, and irrational and consequently very distressing to one who had the task of cultivating her understanding, reforming her manners, and aiding her to acquire those ornamental attainments which, unlike her sister, she despised as much as the rest. Her mother was partly aware of her deficiencies, and gave me many a lecture as to how I should try to form her tastes, and endeavour to rouse and cherish her dormant vanity, and by insinuating skilful flattery, to win her attention to the desired objects which I would not do, and how I should prepare and smooth the path of learning, till she could glide along it without the least exertion to herself, which I could not, for nothing can be taught to any purpose without some little exertion on the part of the learner. As a moral agent, Matilda was reckless, headstrong, violent, and unamenable to reason. One proof of the deplorable state of her mind was, that from her father's example she had learned to swear like a trooper, her mother was greatly shocked by the unladylike trick, and wondered how she had picked it up. "'But you can soon break her of it, Miss Gray,' said she. "'It is only a habit, and if you will just gently remind her every time she does so, I am sure she will soon lay it aside.' I not only gently reminded her, I tried to impress upon her how wrong it was, and how distressing to the ears of decent people, but all in vain. I was only answered by a careless laugh, and— "'Oh, Miss Gray, how shocked you are! I am so glad!' Or, "'Well, I can't tell that Papa shouldn't have taught me. I learned it all from him, and maybe a bit from the coachman.' Her brother John, alias Master Murray, was about eleven when I came, a fine, stout, healthy boy, frank and good-hearted in the main, and might have been a decent lad had he been properly educated. But now he was as rough as a young bear, boisterous, unruly, unprincipled, untaught, unteachable, at least for a governess under his mother's eye. His masters at school might be able to manage him better, for to school he was sent, greatly to my relief, in the course of a year. 
in a state, it is true, of scandalous ignorance as to Latin, as well as the more useful, though more neglected, things. And this, doubtless, would all be laid to the account of his education, having been entrusted to an ignorant female teacher, who had presumed to take in hand what she was wholly incompetent to perform. I was not delivered from his brother till full twelve months after, when he also was despatched in the same state of disgraceful ignorance as the former. Master Charles was his mother's peculiar darling. He was little more than a year younger than John, but much smaller, paler, and less active and robust. A pettish, cowardly, capricious, selfish little fellow, only active in doing mischief, and only clever in inventing falsehoods, not simply to hide his faults, but in mere malicious wantonness, to bring odium upon others. In fact, Master Charles was a very great nuisance to me. It was a trial of patience to live with him peaceably, to watch over him was worse, and to teach him, or pretend to teach him, was inconceivable. At ten years old, he could not read correctly the easiest line in the simplest book, and as, according to his mother's principle, he was to be told every word, before he had time to hesitate, or examine his orthography, and never even to be informed, as a stimulant to exertion, that other boys were more forward than he, it is not surprising that he made but little progress during the two years I had charge of his education. His minute portions of Latin grammar, etc., were to be repeated over to him, till he chose to say he knew them, and then he was to be helped to say them. If he made mistakes in his little easy sums in arithmetic, they were to be shown him at once, and the sum done for him, instead of his being left to exercise his faculties in finding them out himself so that, of course, he took no pains to avoid mistakes, but frequently set down his figures at random, without any calculation at all. I did not invariably confine myself to these rules. It was against my conscience to do so, but I seldom could venture to deviate from them in the slightest degree, without incurring the wrath of my little pupil, and subsequently of his mamma, to whom he would relate my transgressions maliciously exaggerated, or adorned with embellishments of his own and often, in consequence, was I on the point of losing or resigning my situation. But, for their sakes at home, I smothered my pride, and suppressed my indignation, and managed to struggle on till my little tormentor was dispatched to school, his father declaring that home education was no go for him, it was plain. His mother spoiled him outrageously, and his governess could make no hand of him at all.